Thank you so much. It's just delightful to be here with all of you today. Just look at this room. The last time I was at Sockness, I don't think there were half this many people here. And I definitely want to thank the uh, program committee and the board of directors for the fantastic job that you've done in selecting everything for this conference to go so smoothly. I also want to have everyone here thank the wait staff who are doing such a wonderful job for us. They've been so attentive and courteous and, uh, gosh, too much food, I must say. So I'm here today to talk to you about some of my experiences as a medical physician and as a medical researcher. I know that some of you out there are probably thinking, do I want to be a doctor? Do I want to be a scientist? And in fact, I'm here to tell you it's really possible to do both, and that's where my path led me to the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. You see on the screen the logo for the Mayo Clinic, which includes three shields. The center logo is patient care. That institution has always had its firm foundation in providing the best care to each patient every day that we can conceive. But very early on, the Mayo brothers themselves realized that without the shields of research and education behind that patient care, you could never have new treatments to offer patients, and you could never extend those treatments to other practitioners across the country, and indeed across the world. And so those three shields are part of my everyday life. I love taking care of patients. That's why I'm a doctor. It is a privilege to be a healer, and I never regret the years that it took, even though uh, there were many times when it wasn't clear what would happen next. My patient care involves cancer patients, predominantly women with cancers such as breast and gynecologic cancer, but my original laboratory research was in melanoma, both bench research and clinical trials, and so I never gave up the, the opportunity to participate in melanoma research. And in fact, my mother, before she passed, said to me, you've been studying all this time on melanoma. Why haven't you got a cure? And uh, uh, many of our patients ask that too. And, and clearly, the science background now is leading us closer and closer for uh, better treatments for a lot of diseases like melanoma. My research is predominantly clinical research, but I still also do some immunologic research and some melanoma bench research. And education was my first field. I have taught everything from Head Start to medical school, uh, and I don't regret those years in Head Start either. I, I honestly think that's one of the best things we can do for our children growing up. So I have the opportunity to practice all three shields every day and not give up on the possibility of that variety. My offices are in the Gonda building, that glass building that you see in the middle. I'm on the 10th floor. Come see me. It's OK. I hope you'll stop by the Mayo booth, which is 646, and talk to my colleague Dennis Mays so that you can learn more about the variety of, of opportunities that Mayo has for students at all levels of training, whether it's high school, undergraduate, post-baccalaureate, graduate school, medical school, et cetera. So we do offer a variety of things, and we're always looking for students who are interested in finding their own path. We have three campuses. I happen to be at Rochester, Minnesota. We have a campus in Jacksonville, Florida, and one in Scottsdale, Arizona, and all three of them do do some forms of research, education, training, and patient care. Well, this is Dr. William Worrell Mayo. He's the father of the famous Mayo brothers. 150 years ago, Abraham Lincoln called on Dr. Mayo, who was a respected small town physician to head up the analysis of recruits for the first Minnesota unit of the Union Army. 
And so Dr. Mayo, who at that time was struggling to get a practice in many of these kind of rural areas of Minnesota, had to up and move his family yet one more time, this time to Rochester, Minnesota, which was the headquarters. It's said that his wife, Louise, who had to take their two daughters, four-year-old son, Will, and was pregnant with yet their fourth child and move them again. She said to him, and this is in the biography, now nothing more, no more. I'm not moving again. And I'm sure some of you have families where that's been the issue too. In fact, I do think that my husband said that to me at least once when we went from Chicago, Illinois, to Grand Forks, North Dakota, to Denver, Colorado, to Bismarck, North Dakota, to Rochester. In Rochester, he said, this is it. So here we are. Well, every journey belongs to someone who is the inspirator. And this is my grandma, Ada Salmon. Ada is one of those people who had inherent intelligence but never had the chance to really get any major education. But she had all kinds of traditional knowledge to share with me on plants and animals and weather. We were hearing the other day about how the indigenous people had all this knowledge and we must not lose that capacity. And so Ada encouraged me to stay in school. My father hadn't finished high school, my mother hadn't finished high school, but she told me very early on, we expect you to stay in school. And she also told me that she thought I could be a healer. So I'm sure many of you have grandmothers who set high standards for you, and you're never sure where that's gonna go. And so at the time, I really didn't have the concept of what it would take to eventually become a doctor. I idolized my school teachers. I loved school. And so one of my teachers, Rose Brown, he, shown here, was one of those who really helped me to write letters of support so that I could go to college, so that I could get some scholarships. And it wasn't until I was an adult myself that I heard the story that Rose wasn't allowed to go to school during the Depression. And it really was only when she was 40 years old that she went back to become a teacher. Little did I know that her example would also stand me in good stead. Well, this picture is a famous one of Watson on the left and Crick, who won the Nobel Prize for the discovery of what has become known as the double helix. I actually was very fortunate. I grew up in Chicago as a city Indian, and the University of Chicago picked out students from various inner city high schools to invite for special seminars. And it was really less than a year after Dr. Watson and Dr. Crick won their Nobel Prize that I sat in a room much smaller than this and heard the story of how they struggled to try to identify and, and uh, make this a, a very uh, real possibility that we could understand the secrets of life. And so now, DNA and all the mysteries of DNA and RNA are an everyday common thing in medical practice and in many scientific fields. At this conference, you're hearing about other areas that may in the future lead to new Nobel Prizes. Maybe it'll be the microbiome. Maybe it'll be people who work in, in uh, biogenetics or pharmacogenomics. Whatever it is at this meeting that excites you, stay connected with the people that do these presentations and think about whether or not there's more knowledge that you can gain by going into such a field. I really never had the concept as a high school student that one day, about 30 years later, I would sit at a dinner at a table like this with Dr. Watson and hear him still talk about how excited he was about new ideas in science. But there were years when I didn't have any opportunity to go back to school. I married, I taught school, which I planned to do. I stayed home with my young daughter and family. And I don't regret those years. 
I think the reason that I mention this today is that many of you may have a very straight path to your goal, and that's wonderful if that's how it works. But many of you have family considerations, many will have children along the way, and sometimes you have to take that time before you really have the maturity or the opportunity to continue on. And that was my case as well. So, uh, so that's my daughter Krista when she was about two, and as you heard, I didn't go to medical school until about a year or so later. University of North Dakota, any North Dakotans here? Or are they snowed in? North Dakota, yay! The in-med program at the University of North Dakota was my salvation. Not only was it a wonderful educational experience for me with scientists and teachers who were really committed, committed to teaching, uh, but uh, it was a smaller class size. It was very compatible to have the cultural component to my education. Uh, there was the Indian school for my daughter, Eagle Feather, and so even though I wasn't quite sure about North Dakota, never having been there before I applied, and coming from the inner city of Chicago, boy, that was a rude awakening. I have never regretted, and I've been very grateful to the InMed program all these years. So in, in Grand Forks, before it snows, it can be very beautiful like this. Little did I know what the winters would be like, but you know, we survived, uh, and uh, early on, one of the issues was that in order to take that opportunity, we had to temporarily uh, separate our family. My husband had to find a job, we had to find a place to live, but gradually all those things fell into place. But as you can see here, the life of a med student is not one of running around the park all day. And I was fortunate that my husband was ready and willing to pick up those extra pieces and, and let me get the, the time to study that I needed. And I, I definitely tell all of you who have family considerations that this is a journey that is a full commitment for everyone in that partnership. You know, uh, when I thought about going to medical school, my husband called my bluff. He said to me, I don't want to hear 10 years from now, your college professor said you were the best student, you should go to medical school. Do it or let's not talk about it. So hopefully someone loves you well enough to call your bluff. If you say you're going to get that PhD, you do it. If you're going to do an MD, PhD, somebody's going to call you on that. Don't just say, oh, I could have been, I should have been, I would have been. Do it. Well, one of the things that, that is very clear about going into medicine is that there are many years of training, and that often, often also involves moving. So as I said, we went to North Dakota, then we went to Colorado. Our daughter grew up in Colorado, and uh, every spare minute that we could, <clears throat> we went to the mountains, and I love the mountains. I thank Colorado for making my daughter a marathon runner, a triathlete, and I think that's, that's why she can chase three kids around, too. So the fact that she grew up at altitude gave her beautiful lungs and, fortunately, non-smoking lungs. You're hearing at this meeting a lot about mentors. There are many different types of mentors, and hopefully you will have more than one in your lifetime to give credit to. We've heard about some wonderful mentors that we've honored at this meeting and other meetings. For me, at Colorado, uh, this professor, who was also a clinician scientist, Dr. William Robinson, was my ideal. Not only was he beautiful in talking with patients at the bedside, sometimes under very difficult circumstances, he was articulate, he was a scientist. His main area of research was CML, but uh, he also ran the melanoma clinic, which had been increasing during those uh, years in Colorado. And so uh, he you know, encouraged me to work in his lab. And so that's how I got interested in the bench research side of cancer treatment. Well, I'm here to tell you that Dr. Robinson wasn't totally honest with me. Has that happened to you? He said, oh, this will be an easy rotation. Your senior year of medical school, 
you know, no nights, no weekends. You'll have more time with your family. Baloney. <laughs> The, the study that we designed required a lot of timed assays. It required me to really be very careful about keeping my cell cultures from being contaminated. And so it was probably as many hours as any night rotation in the hospital that I had. But by the time I finished that rotation, I was hooked. So here you have some of the first human melanoma cells that I ever grew in Dr. Robinson's lab. And the reason that I wanted to do that is that most of the studies before that time had focused on mouse melanomas. But mice that get melanoma are not the same as humans with melanoma. We know that. And I was determined to try to develop a particular culture technique to not only grow them, but to analyze different growth factors. And that's why I had all these timed experiments to do. At the end of, of that rotation, it was time to graduate. Here's my wonderful husband, now of 47 years, Alan. <coughs> and I must say, anyone that goes through this kind of training, no one does it alone. So on graduation day, I had a special diploma made up for Al, and it was called the PWT, Putting Wife Through. It still hangs on our wall. And as a culmination of that research that I did on melanoma, I was invited to speak at my first international meeting. And so here you see me in front of the Taj Mahal at a meeting where I spoke on melanoma in what was then Bombay, now called Mumbai, India. And I found I love travel. I absolutely love travel. On a city bus in Chicago, I never imagined that I would go anywhere else in the world. But I love travel, and I love different cultures. And so being in academics really uh, allows me that luxury also to, to go to many places. I told Jenny, who was organizing for my trip here, well, it's going to be tight because I'm in Ethiopia the week before, and I was. I was in Ethiopia last week talking on women's cancers, particularly the problems that they have with cervical cancer and also how that ties into problems with HIV worldwide. Uh, and yet, I don't regret taking the time to go and interact with other people who are committed to help women around the world. So you see, in this picture, I had my, uh, my afro. And last week, I was delighted to see all those beautiful Ethiopian women in their natural afros. And I'm thinking, well, maybe time for a haircut change. As a, another um, thing that happened to me because of the melanoma research, I won the, the Young Investigator Award from the American Society of Clinical Oncology, which is our major cancer research organization. And uh, that was now almost 30 years ago. So I guess now I'm sort of a near young investigator. Can I say that? And along the way, as I said, other mentors come into your life. This is Dr. James Hampton. Dr. Hampton was the very first American Indian medical oncologist. He is 81 years old. He still practices in Oklahoma City. I met with him just in March of this year, and his, his desire to help every patient in front of him is, is no less uh, in spite of his advanced age. And I didn't know about Dr. Hampton when I was growing up. So I hope those of you here who are American Indian, here's the challenge. Dr. Hampton and I can never retire until one of you steps up to be the next medical oncologist. My focus on women's health has helped, though. I have one of my students, Amanda Bruegel, who's now at MD Anderson, finishing in gynecologic oncology. So uh, I will uh, be very grateful when, when she takes her role in, in leadership about cervical cancer. The other aspect of knowing and, and loving Dr. Hampton is that he has never lost his connection to the community and to his cultural pieces. As Native people, we talk a lot about balance. I don't think anyone can go through the strenuous years that we have of training without trying to really center themselves with that balance, 
physically, emotionally, relationship-wise, spiritually. And so my culture still does that for me, and I encourage each of you to take the best of your culture with you wherever you go. Well, I'm at Mayo Clinic, and one of my programs is Native Circle. When, uh, when I joined the Mayo Clinic, I wasn't, I wasn't um, seeking them out. All of a sudden, I had a call from them. And I had connected with the Mayo Clinic because I wanted my patients to have access to the latest and best treatments. And so twice a year, I would go there for meetings and serve on a committee and stay connected with some of the researchers. And so one day, one of them called me up and said, you know, we're going to start a breast clinic, and we really would like you to come and give a talk and think about joining us. And I said, did someone say I was looking for a job? Because I'm not. So I had my own clinic. I had everything settled. But you know, uh, when I went there and I heard what they had to offer, and they said, you know, the commitment you've made to tribes, that's important to you. That's important to us. And so here is where I am. Our Native Circle website provides a lot of materials for communities and also a very full bibliography for those of you who are still writing those term papers in college or graduate school. Our Native American programs grew to include the Spirit of Eagles, which is funded now almost 18 years by the National Institutes of Health. And that program involves training, research, and education about Health, health disparities in Native people. So part of my research is clinical trials, and part of my research is on overcoming health disparities. So I, I hope you'll look at our website sometime soon. We do have a, a national meeting coming up in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So we still have openings. Hey, Albuquerque, we'll be there in three weeks. <laughs> Good. Come, come see us. We'll have a student meeting on October 25th, and we'll have major scientific presentations on cancer in Indian country on the 26th and 27th. So we hope some of you will be there for us. Well, all work and no play, and scientists have to play too. And uh, I think when I was introduced, they told you my maiden name is Salmon, which is true. And I often tell tribal leaders that that has to be why I went into cancer research. And after all, I'm always swimming upstream. And on my left here is one of my mentees, Matt Getz, who uh, this was his first trip to Alaska, and he was going to fly in and out. And I said, oh, Matt, you can't do that. You've got to come fishing with me at midnight. He said, fishing at midnight? Are you kidding? And so we went, and we got our King Salmon license, and off we went. And we had the most wonderful time catching fish that night. And uh, Matt uh, stayed in research. Uh, he was uh, very inclined to breast cancer research. And he now is working on some of the newest, most innovative treatments for breast cancer at Mayo Clinic. So I'm very delighted. They say that as a teacher, you're successful if your student can teach you something. And I can definitely say that about Matt. The other interesting circle of life piece of that is Matt is married to a wonderful young woman who graduated from high school with my daughter in North Dakota. Go figure. How does that happen? Here is uh, the cover from Science Magazine 20 years ago when they were predicting biologically based therapies would be the new avenue for medical research. Took us 20 years almost, but my best friend, Denise, suffers from rheumatoid arthritis, and she was almost totally incapacitated when her doctor found one of the biologically-based rheumatoid arthritis inhibitors. And now she not only can walk, she can hold her grandchildren, and she has been the beneficiary of some of that new science. As you know, melanoma is a disease that has been very, very resistant to standard kinds of chemotherapies. And now we have some of the most exciting biologically based protein kinase inhibitors that are changing the face of melanoma. And so I'm so glad that I've lived to see the day when some of the things that we understood needed to change are now finally changing. Those melanoma cells, they look so innocuous in culture years ago. But we've learned a lot about how actually 
complicated they can be. Here's how the cancer cell works. You see? Easy, huh? <laughs> well, this may be a bit facetious, but it is a reminder that no one thing, no one approach is necessarily going to cure all cancer. And uh, anybody here from LA? I know there are a lot of Californians. Where is the LA group? All right. So a, a year or so ago, they were talking about Carmageddon. Remember that? That all the cars were going to get all tied up because of road construction and nowhere to go. It didn't happen. Why? Well, every astute commuter had their own bypass path. Do you think cancer cells are any different? You have to block more than one roadway if you're going to put these cells into remission. So my grandmother died of tuberculosis, and there was a time when they said TB was hopeless, and I remember my uncles dying of TB, and I remember polio and the iron lungs, and I have a terrible scar from smallpox on my arm, but those things are no longer the scourge they once was. What we have to realize is cancer is still only a disease or a combination of diseases. It is not hopeless. Louis Pasteur said, fortune favors the prepared mind. You work hard, but then you need to be open to opportunities as they present themselves. Everyone in this audience has opportunities that are going to open up because of your association with this organization. Don't count on luck. You can have fortune, but not without hard work. Well, these are my three grandchildren. Life has been full, and uh, everything is really in, in um, the next generation. So on the left is Marcy, the seven-year-old. She's our bookworm. She's the one that everybody says is like grandma, and that, you know, that of course, grandma's heart goes pitter-patter when they say that. The youngest, the middle one there, Reese, she's our little gymnast and wall climber. Literally, she climbs walls. She does. Mason, he's the oldest. He's nine. Well, last night I had to go buy Mason a dream catcher. You know why? Last time I was there, Mason says to me, Grandma, Grandma, my dream is to be in the NFL. I know the literature on head injuries and back injuries and knee injuries, and Grandma's not real happy about that. So I'm hoping he might catch a different dream. <laughs> Otherwise, he's a fast run runner like my daughter, the marathoner, so maybe he'll be the wide receiver. So, so many different things over a lifetime, so many paths that someone can take. Little did I know that I would go into medicine, treat cancer, travel the world, see research come to fruition, and stay in Rochester, Minnesota. <laughs> so I've been in Minnesota long enough to know uh, some of the quotes from Garrison Keillor, who's a humorist. Garrison Keillor wrote this book, Lake Wobegon, and Lake Wobegon is this mythical town where all the women are strong, all the men are good looking, and all the children are above average. Well, you know what? At Sockness, all of you women, you're strong. All of you men, you're so handsome. And we know all of you are way above average. So Godspeed on your own journey. <laughs>